The lure of horror video gaming is strong. Gone is the frustration of watching protagonists make the wrong decision by fleeing upstairs from the knife-wielding maniac. Instead, it is replaced by the more active identification of the player as participant in the diegetic worlds. Now it is you who will be forced to make the decision to traipse down into the murky basement. I couldn't have said it better myself, thanks Adam Daniel. If you've been a part of internet culture, you're probably a fan of video games, and if not, you're missing out. Video games are used as a form of escape, a way to get outside of the real world for at least a little bit. Plus, they have the ability to provide us with a sense of comfort, you know, depending on the setting. And sometimes, they give us a much-needed dose of adrenaline, and that's what we're looking at today. More specifically, how horror games are the perfect breeding ground for psychoanalytic theory, looking at one game in particular. Now, I'm sure you're asking yourself, psychoanalysis? You mean that Freud guy? Isn't that just for psychology? Well, yes and no. Freud is considered the father of psychoanalysis, yes, but the theory doesn't just have to apply to psychology, it can be used to discuss literature, too. And this is where you might be asking yourself, why would I be looking at a video game instead of some 100-year-old novel? Well, one, who has time to do that? And two, even if I did have the ability to read a long-ass novel in like two weeks, why would I do that when I can just dick around and play a video game? Alright, admittedly, perhaps that isn't the best reasoning. But video games have a place in literature. We use books for the same reasons we do video games, but there's an added difference due to the medium. As pointed out by Daniel, the audience is forced to make a decision. We become active participants in a narrative, making decisions that directly impact the story we're engaging with. And horror games have quite a few ties to psychoanalysis, something that I was not expecting when I started this project. Horror games and horror as a genre in general tend to include many aspects of the uncanny. The uncanny is a broad notion that applies to phenomena, in both life and artworks, that are eerie yet enticing, strange yet familiar, creepy yet not horrific. And as Freud put it, the uncanny involves something from ordinary life that is familiar yet alien and frightening. In other words, the uncanny is something that you could easily recognize, but there's something off. Like when you watch the Polar Express and the animation just throws you, or mannequins. You know, horror games sure do love those. And I mean, horror games are a prime medium for the uncanny. But it's not always just the graphics. As Ewan Kirkland points out, the strange relationship between players and Avatar as an inanimate digital puppet becomes imbued with life. The player becomes increasingly machine-like in their identification with the world of the computer. These might be understood as expressing qualities of the uncanny. The player becomes part of the uncanny experience of playing. Now tell me, can a novel do that? But that's enough of that for now. We'll return to the uncanny later. Let's get into the game. And just as a few housekeeping notes, this is an analysis for Corpse Party Blood Covered Repeated Fear, which means nothing is off limits. This has been your spoiler warning. But this game also requires a much needed content and trigger warning. Corpse Party deals with heavy topics, including death, suicide, incest, child abuse, slight homophobia, and pretty much any other awful thing you can think of. This is not a game for the faint of heart, so if discussing any of this bothers you, please feel free to stop watching. Thank you. Corpse Party was originally made in 1996 with a basic RPG maker. However, due to popularity, there were two remakes of the original game, one for Windows and one for the PSP. Today we're looking at the one made for the PSP and eventually was brought to iOS. Because some segments in this version are missing from the Windows version, I don't know why, it just is what it is. Corpse Party begins with a group of high schoolers digging around after school, you know, like high schoolers do. They were supposed to be cleaning up after a festival that happened earlier in the day, but hey, the class rep really wanted to tell a ghost story, and with the help of her homeroom teacher, the spooks are a success. But it's late, and people should be getting home. Even the self-proclaimed main character's little sister shows up wondering where he's been. But of course, they can't leave just yet. Why? Well, one, because the game would be over, but two, and obviously more importantly, because their one friend is leaving, transferring to a new school the next morning. So what do they decide to do? Let's do a ritual the class rep found on the internet to ensure their everlasting friendship. So all nine characters agree to participate in something called the Sachiko Ever After Charm. What could possibly go wrong? Everything. The answer is everything. Soon enough, they experience what they assume to be an earthquake, the screen goes black, and when the screen comes back, we're left with two main characters in a very different location than the one we were just in. And then, when we try to explore, we're brought to a character introduction screen, so let's introduce these nine, shall we? We've got the obligatory useless protagonist, Satoshi. The love interest, Naomi. The resident bad boy, Yoshiki. The overworked TA, Mizuyui. The overachiever, Ayumi. The token gay character that everyone loves, Seiko. The quiet theater kid, Morishigi. The plot device, Mayu. 
and the younger sister who could have avoided all of this if she didn't care so much about her brother, Yuka. And then we're brought back to the game to explore with only Naomi and Seiko. Welcome to Heavenly Host Elementary. You know, the school the class rep was talking about in her ghost story. And speaking of the school, oh boy, is it a hot spot for analysis. The school itself is a representation of the uncanny. Kirkland made this claim about the Silent Hill franchise, that the environment of Silent Hill initially embodies the familiar world of an all-American small town, but a defining feature of the series, periodically the space is transformed into the other world, characterized by decay, dereliction, darkness, and dirt. And while Short Corpse Party is no Silent Hill, this detail about the environment works for both. Heavenly Host is at once familiar, as it embodies the sense of a traditional school, and yet something's off. There are moments when you can't see around corners, you can't access certain areas because the floor is simply gone, and it's absolutely disgusting. Death and decay are everywhere you look. It might seem like a school, but I sure as hell wouldn't want to attend. So why is it like this? It's because Heavenly Host is the unconscious. You see, psychoanalysis is obsessed with the unconscious, and the school is simply that, a representation of one of the key tenets of the theory. Freud had these two principles that he liked to talk about. They were the pleasure and reality principles, and as Dr. Mary Claesius likes to break down for us, the pleasure principle makes us want things that feel good, while the reality principle tells us to channel the energy elsewhere. But the desire for pleasure doesn't just disappear, even when it's sublimated to work. The desires that can't be fulfilled are packed or repressed into a particular place in the mind, the unconscious. In other words, repressed thoughts, feelings, and desires are stored away in the unconscious, meaning you don't really return to them. And Heavenly Host showcases the unspoken desires of certain characters. Oh, did I forget to mention that the school is haunted? Yeah, there are little child ghosts running through these halls. In fact, they're the reason the school exists. They're the reason that the school is Heavenly Host, you know, because they attended classes there before it was demolished. There are actually several variations of the school that we get to witness throughout the game, each one a closed space in which members of the original nine cannot get back to one another. What I'm getting at is that the school represents their unconscious wants and desires. See, these kids suffered. A lot. They were murdered and never got the chance to see their killer brought to justice. So now they spirit away idiots who decide to do the ritual these numbskulls did, wreaking as much revenge and anguish as they want. I mean, they sure do brutally attack Mayu, the girl who was supposed to transfer the next day. And all because their wants and desires have been repressed in the worst way possible. And if you wanted further proof that the school exists as an extension of these tormented children's unconscious, well, once the pair that should be the main characters discover that they can give back key items to the spirits in order to appease them, and then these characters do so, the school begins to reshape and collapse, representing unconscious desires being met and reestablished in new ways. Our high school heroes can even meet up with one another again due to these desires being met. And that's a pretty rad visual representation. The school is also pretty abject, come to think of it. Julia Kristeva developed the term abject, saying that it is neither subject nor object. It draws me toward the place where meaning collapses. And Catherine J. Good now comments on these points, saying that, in short, the abject is everything that threatens the collapse of order by threatening the collapse of meaning and the annihilation of the self. Heavenly Host threatens the boundaries between life and death, between known and unknown, between reality and unconscious. The school exists in a space that lies distinctly between any and all forms of meaning, resisting a tangible definition or explanation. I mean, yeah, we know that the school exists because of the kids, but why? Why didn't these spaces exist with the first murder of Sachiko and her mother? The unknown nature of why the school exists in its present state thanks to these particular children is what makes the school abject. Corpses litter the halls of various spaces within Heavenly Host. In fact, you can interact with every single corpse you encounter. They even make a kind of game of it, having you collect the name tags of each individual that perished within the haunted halls. And you want to know what the best and admittedly worst part about this mechanic is? It's completely arbitrary. You don't get an achievement, there is no prize for collecting all of them, but you are compelled to gather them, scouring the depths of this decaying school. These name tags provide you with a few details about the poor souls now trapped in this nexus. Their name, age, school, homeroom, oh, and of course, how they died. Yeah, you're collecting arbitrary items that tell you how each person suffered in this hellhole. If that isn't some kind of uncanny bullshit, I don't know what is. We're so used to simply collecting items in video games that we don't really stop to think about how absolutely grotesque and twisted the thought of picking name tags off of corpses is because, well, it's just a video game, right? But yeah, we learn how each person died at Heavenly Host once they were sucked into these closed spaces. 
They tell us how each was driven in one way or another towards death, which leads me into our next psychoanalytic term, the death drive, which is pretty self-explanatory. It's a drive one has towards death, a compulsion, if you will. However, to put it in a context that suits horror, Fred Botting has some thoughts on the subject. He says the death drive discloses something alien, inhuman, and uncanny at the same time, something strange and familiar that confounds the safe distinctions between life and death. That this drive designates the dimension of what horror fiction calls undead, a strange, immortal, indestructible life that persists beyond death, insisting that the persistence of life beyond death, that is, as a negation or undeath, remains horrifying. This is all a long-winded way of saying that the death drive presents uncanny attributes because a life is constantly in flux between being alive and dead, something familiar and something strange and unknown, and that undeath is the most horrifying of all since it is given into that compulsion and continues to exist past the limits of that life and death binary. It should then come as no surprise that the school children whose name tags we've been collecting exist in that undead state. While we don't encounter every single ghost present, there are heavy implications that those who died in the school continue to persist as spirits, experiencing the same pain they felt upon the moment of their death for the rest of their existence. For our main cast of living characters, most of them fall into that influx state. The school itself creates an atmosphere that fosters that compulsion to knock at death's door. Many of the characters all experience moments in which they wish they would just die, figuring that giving up might be the best course of action. And well, some of them do meet that unfortunate end only to persist after death. But what drives them to this point? What drives them to feel the need to commit suicide or seek out some other route towards a grisly end? This is where Freud would have a field day. It's time for our favorite subject, sexual repression. Can you sense the cynicism? We have established that the unconscious deals with repression. Well, so does the uncanny. The uncanny is the name for everything that ought to have remained secret and hidden but has come to light. At least according to Freud, a man whose idea of sexuality was extremely heteronormative, meaning that if you deviated even a little from being straight, it's probably the result of some psychosis and repression, which is bullshit. Regardless, this notion persists within the context of psychoanalytic theory. Within the realm of horror, this kind of repression takes on a different perspective. Andrew Tudor posits that sexual repression when used in the horror genre is used to guarantee social order, because horror audiences need to be informed about the limits of acceptable sexuality. The genre acts as a channel for expression of the repressed effect. In doing so, it sustains order, whether by cathartic release of otherwise threatening urges or by reinforcing acceptance of repressive taboos presumed to be essential to social survival. Horror can be conceived to act as a safety valve, where repressed effect threatens to surface and as a figurative reminder of the fearful consequences if the rules of sexual behavior are broken. Guys, gals, and non-binary pals, this includes the barrier gaze trope. This is the idea that any sexuality that breaks the norm needs to either be completely repressed or the individual suffer major consequences in order to uphold the idea that a deviation is wrong. Those consequences tend to be death to that individual that continues to threaten the norm. However, this doesn't just include deviations that fall under the LGBTQ umbrella. In fact, Tudor does point out that there is a need to learn the horror of incest, so we're also including this kind of sexual deviancy. And boy does Corpse Party have some sexual deviancy in both categories. We love that for us. You remember the younger sister of the main character I mentioned a while back? Her name is Yuka, and while they claim that she's 14, she sure does act like she's 8. And man oh man, does she have a giant crush on her older brother. Yuka's got a bit of the case of the Oedipus complex, isn't that lovely? And for posterity's sake, let's just get a definition of the complex in here courtesy of our friend Dr. Klages. So the Oedipus complex explains how desires get repressed, how these repressed desires form the unconscious, how girls and boys learn to desire objects outside of their family, how each sex learns to desire someone of the opposite sex, and how the superego, the reality principle, or what we call conscience, gets formed. The Oedipus complex happens as a developmental stage in childhood, according to Freud, and is all about the conflict that is created due to the conceptual and social contradictions of family. So like, in a nuclear family scenario where the child is a heterosexual male, the kid grows up loving and caring for his mom until he realizes that he has to like people outside of the family. But he likes girls, and mom's a girl, but he can't like his mom because that's weird. There's a lot of moving parts that contradict themselves, and in Yuka's case, she grows up a little and recognizes that she likes boys, but she can't like dad because, well, that's weird, and he also loves mom, so she can't even begin to interfere with that. But her brother's an unattached boy. Huh. Might as well project some repressed desires on that sibling. 
That is until he reveals that he likes Naomi and Yuka gets real upset. In fact, there's only one ending in which Yuka reveals her feelings towards Satoshi, and that's the same ending that leads to Naomi and Yuka both dying. Yeah, Yuka sacrifices herself for Satoshi and confesses her undying love. This game has no time for sexual deviancy, especially incest. I do find it interesting that the game makes a point of having Yuka see Satoshi as a father figure and Naomi as a mother figure throughout because this alternate ending in the final chapter really hits home with the Oedipus complex and girls being all about the desire to kill the mother, marry the father, and have his baby. And thank god that does not happen. This alternate ending really drives home the idea that if Yuka can't have Satoshi then no one can. But enough of that, I can only take so much of the subplot for so long, time to look at other kinds of sexual repression and deviancy. We have a gay icon, everyone, and her name is Seiko. Seiko is one of the girls among the pair we initially wake up with when we're first brought to Heavenly Host alongside Naomi. There are numerous occasions in which Seiko cannot help but point out how great Naomi's ass looks, and there's even an optional sequence in which the two girls share a smooch, reaffirming Seiko's unwillingness to die in the school. But alas, this is a game called Corpse Party, so of course the first character to die without you being able to do anything about it is the gay girl. Seiko is the first one to succumb to the school's reign of terror, and initially we're led to believe it's a suicide, which would play into the idea that she could not keep this side of her repressed, therefore she recognizes that she must suffer some consequence. However, her death is not a suicide. Four chapters later, it's revealed she was murdered, and not by a ghost. Well, at least not directly. No, we end up bearing witness to a brutal murder at the hands of Seiko's love interest, Naomi. What a fucking turn of events to hit you with in the last chapter. Damn, Naomi was like, I can't afford to have this issue, I love Satoshi, gotta repress this in the only way I know how right now, being possessed and all. Yeah, the ghosts in this place are absolutely homophobic and it shows. I mean, there's even some heavy implication that there was another gay character within the confines of the school, which is found by reading the victim's memoirs in chapter 3. The character talks about wrestling with some guy and just wanting to see their face again one last time before they perish. And if that isn't the definition of gay yearning, I don't know what is. But anyway, Naomi being faced with this realization that she killed her best friend and potential lover is where we stumble upon our first Lacanian concept, the mirror stage. Lacan, another key contributor to psychoanalytic theory, described the mirror stage in terms of a stage of childhood development. He theorized that it occurs the moment a child sees an image in the mirror, it thinks that image is me. But it's not the child, it's only an image. But another person, usually the mother, is there to reinforce the misrecognition. The mirror image, the whole person the baby mistakes as itself, is known in psychoanalytic terminology as an ideal ego, a perfect whole self who has no insufficiency. This ideal ego becomes internalized. He goes on to say that essentially the mirror image we create has no lack because we project this image onto ourselves that we're complete. In other words, we have two selves, an internal perception and external perception and we think the internal one is complete and how we see ourselves. You see, Naomi thinks she's fine, well, relatively speaking. She grieves over the loss of a dear friend, not understanding why Seiko would take her own life, and that Naomi should have apologized sooner, maybe preventing the whole thing. Naomi tries to carry on for Seiko, believing that that would be the best way to honor her. She sees herself as Seiko's friend, and then chapter 5 happens and reality comes crashing down. Naomi stumbles across a tape and watches as someone's own record of the events shatters the very perception of herself she's tried to maintain since chapter 1. She watches as she's the one who put the rope around her best friend's neck. Naomi goes from seeing the internal perception of herself as just being Seiko's best friend to witnessing the external perception that she's avoided and had blocked out, that she's Seiko's murderer. And this becomes a very important struggle for her. Actually, with the game's logic, if she refuses to accept this new perception, she will die. But if she recognizes that both perceptions of herself are true, she lives, forming a new internal and external perception. And yes, both options can happen, thank you so very much, Corpse Party. So now that we've got sexual repression out of the way with a few theories subcategorized, I realize that we still haven't talked about the antagonists much at all. Well, we've discussed them briefly, the main antagonists being the ghost children we see moving around in the game. They are the only ones with kind of corporeal bodies, or at least they're the only ones who got animated a bit more than just being a dancing flame, so you know they're important. These are the kids that form the spaces. Remember the whole unconscious thing? Yeah, that's them. But they have other psychoanalytic aspects tied to them. What if I told you they're perfect examples of castration anxiety? No, please don't call the cops. I know I've talked about a lot of strange things involving children, but trust me, this isn't what you think. Now, obviously the theory came about because Freud had some kind of weird obsession with genitals, and this does stem from the idea that the son could develop anxiety as a result of the Oedipus complex, fearing that his father, angry at the boy's desire to kill him, will cut off his penis in revenge. 
therefore causing the boy to enter into the castration complex, which forces him in fear of his father and fear of losing his penis to repress libidinal desire for his mother. Alrighty, that's a lot to unpack. Again, hold off on calling the authorities. I'm not suggesting that grade school children experience genital mutilation. What I am suggesting is that they experienced what this concept boils down to at its fundamental level. The fear being generated due to the symbolic connection of the body and power. So what does that mean? Well, a key aspect that each of these children share is that they are missing their tongues. Yeah, when you go through the game, you discover that each child had their tongue removed after their death. Here is the bodily connection, so where's the power come into play? Well, even as a spirit, you need your tongue in order to talk, in order to communicate. By the killer forcibly removing their tongues, they are no longer able to communicate with those around them. They are powerless to speak up against their killer because of what happened to them. Remember how I mentioned how they created the school, which is their unconscious desires? Yeah, well, part of that is due to the fact that they literally cannot express those desires because that ability was stripped from them. Their castration anxiety is represented by literal children being stripped of the only power they had to combat their killer, and that's fucked. So then, who's the killer? Well, it sure is pinned on this guy. You know, the janitor who comes up and beats the shit out of Yoshiki. And another guy who absolutely deserves it. Yanagahori is the janitor who existed when Heavenly Host was a real school and not some hellhole. Though you could make the argument that it was to anyway. Throughout the game, you find old posters and flyers that discuss the murders of the children, and most of them point out that Yanagohori was guilty of those murders. But this is a horror game, it can't be that easy, and of course it's not. Chapter 4 is the turnaround, when you get information that leads you to realizing that Yanagohori was only a pawn. In fact, a lot of the testimonies you find make it seem like no one really saw it coming that he would be a child murderer. But before we get into that, let's introduce our last concept, shall we? Lacan's symbolic, and we're not talking about symbols you find in any kind of media, no no. We're talking about something that is much more complicated, so please bear with me. Lacan talks about three concepts, need, demand, and desire, that roughly correspond to three phases of development, the real, the imaginary, and the symbolic. The symbolic realm, which is marked by the concept of desire, is the equivalent of adulthood, or more specifically for Lacan, the symbolic realm is the structure of language itself, which we have to enter into in order to become speaking subjects, in order to say I and have I designate something that appears to be stable. Dr. Cleges goes on to add that in the realm of the real, according to Lacan, there is no language because there is no loss, no lack, no absence. There is only complete fullness, needs, and the satisfaction of needs. Hence, the real is always beyond language, unrepresentable in language, and therefore irretrievably lost when one enters into language. This is all an incredibly complex and long-winded way of saying that when we're discussing the symbolic, we're talking about language as a structure, that we want to believe that there's something in us that can be expressed through language, but we struggle because there's a chance that language will never truly express what we mean. And that's kind of the case with Yanagahori. Language is never going to help him. In fact, Yanagahori kind of combines both the symbolic and castration anxiety, though his castration is a bit more difficult to ascertain at first. He loses the ability to speak, but not in the same fashion as the children. Essentially, his family is cursed, and a resident ghost kind of just chips away at his mental health until he's no longer able to talk. Regardless, the deaths are pinned on him. The only surviving child from the four who were abducted, Sachiko, gives an eyewitness testimony that convicts him, and because he's not able to utilize language in order to express anything to counter that, it is the language other people use that create an identity for him, and thanks to that testimony, that's all people are going to think of him. In fact, it's revealed that he took his own life while imprisoned, and you get the sense that people probably chalked that up to the guilt of killing the kids, whereas I'd venture to guess he did it because it was the only way he could get away from the identity that was created for him. Language does nothing but fail to express who and what he is, a kind-hearted man that was targeted, by a vengeful ghost who then forces him to follow the will of her reincarnated daughter. Yeah, that doesn't help his case either, and neither does that such hammer. Oh, by the way, Sachiko is the actual murderer? Yeah, this game is a lot. I mean, it gives us an excellent overview on the use of the uncanny in video games, as well as showcasing an elaborate representation of the unconscious. It shows objection in its display of horror elements while really hitting us with the effects of the death drive. Not to mention it gives us plenty of sexual repression to make us upset with an unneeded example of inse- I mean the Oedipus complex alongside the mirror stage. The game even includes castration anxiety and the symbolic. Corpse Party really has it all. And yet, I really do enjoy this game, and I don't know what that says about me. Perhaps I just like getting spooked, or perhaps I just really enjoy interesting storylines that like to throw in odd twists in the final chapter. 
who's to say. What I do know is that the second game in the series is on sale on Steam right now, and uh, if you need me, I'll be playing Corpse Party Book of Shadows. Thanks for hanging out and letting me nerd the fuck out about a video game. Catch you next time.